Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I got to tell you, I, I love listening to some of my, my Democrat friends uh, complaining that, you know, well, you know, these Democratic politicians, they're, 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 not doing, they're not doing the thing. They're not moving Biden's agenda. They should all be, should all be on the same page. And look, I would love it if they would. The reason, and I always love the Roy Rogers quote, you know, I'm not a member of an organized party, I'm a Democrat. I always love that because you look at what's going on. It's like herding cats. And at the front of the line, you've got Manchin and Cinema. Uh, how do you get them to come back? Well, figure out how to feed them a little bit. This will play itself out. We'll see where this takes us. But to think that, you know, well, we're going to all just fall in the line, not going to happen. Understand, policy is really popular. Should be talking more about policies, less about than Joe Manchin. And here to share some thoughts on how we get these popular policies moved through and maybe do a little bit better with messaging. Kind of a thought. Uh, I've asked Annette Shanker Azario to come talk with us. She's the principal and founder of ASO Communications. Uh, Annette, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me. So, like I said, I you know you look at the fact that our you know, democratic policy is wildly popular. Uh, we want, you know, money to help keep kids out of poverty. Uh, we want education for kids on the front end. And when they go to go on to, the, to, uh, to college, a lot of, granny needs new chompers and some, some goggles and all that stuff. Popular stuff. How come we can't get it through? How come we can't message this? How is it Mitch McConnell is the Lucy and pulls the football away every time? Yeah. Well, first, let me just acknowledge as a big acknowledgement for me that not everything is a messaging problem. There may in fact be members of the Democratic Party in leadership who don't necessarily share our values and our views and wanna get it done. But you asked me a messaging question, so let me answer that. First thing that I would say is I often tell my clients, don't take your policies out in public. That is unseemly. Policies are great for insider baseball kinds of conversations, but much like when you are wandering through the grocery store and you see that box of instant brownies and you look at the front of that box, what is there a picture of? A brownie, right? But when you open up the box, there's no brownie in that box. There's a bunch of powder. And on the back, there's a set of steps you need to take. We need to stop selling the recipe and start selling the brownie. And it's funny because in your description, Rick, you sort of predicted what I was going to say. You were selling the recipe. I mean, pardon me. You were selling the brownie and not the recipe. So when we look, for example, at a policy like paid family leave or universal health care or raising the minimum wage, wildly popular things, when we say instead you're there the first time your newborn smiles, or you're paid enough to put food on the table and you're home in time to eat it. When we sell the outcome of the policy, wildly more popular and perhaps more vital, more likely to increase mobilization. Because again, often our messaging trouble is not that people don't think our ideas are right, is that they don't think our ideas are possible. And so our opposition isn't the opposition, it's actually cynicism. And so it's about messaging that will mobilize, not garner just agreement, but repetition. No. And that's where we need to be talking about outcomes and not the names of our policies. No, I, I, I'm, you're spot on there. You know, what I always say that Republicans talk in term, terms of narratives, they tell stories. Uh, Democrats seem to wanna show you how smart they are and how wonky we can be. And I'm like, no, no, no. How are you gonna make my life better? How are we gonna get things done? How am I gonna get that hole patched in front of my house? How am I gonna make 100%. sure that my kids get to get an education or healthcare or any of the things uh, that, that again, are popular uh to me it's it's the pitch and it's oftentimes when we try to make ourselves what i like to call the reasonable adults in the room so we say things for example like doing universal health care will be cheaper well it turns out when you actually test that kind of message a message that it will be cheaper which of course is true i'm not debating what's true or false here Folks who are persuadable in the sample, folks who are on the fence, who could go either way and aren't quite sure what to think, so non-ideologically cemented folks, that actually reaffirms the opposition's narrative. 
Because when you tell folks it's going to be cheaper if we do it this way, what you're doing is you are giving into the opposition's frame. You are tacitly acknowledging that the way to make public policy decisions is, will it grow GDP? Will it shrink GDP? Will it be more money? Will it be less money? So you tell people, first and foremost, that's how to evaluate this. Right. And then you actually raise the suspicions that they're most afraid of. The idea that it's going to be crappy healthcare, that you're going to be waiting forever and ever. The horror stories and lies they've been fed about, quote unquote, socialized medicine, that there's going to be rationing. Instead, what effective messaging does is it seizes the moral high ground. It says things like life and health shouldn't be for sale. Or no matter what we look like or where we come from, when someone we love or is ill or injured, we want them to get the very best care without fearing that we'll go bankrupt for them to do it. So you want to talk just like what you said in imageable terms. How will this feel walking through my life? Not what is the name of your 67 point plan? Yeah, no, exactly. On the universal health care front, I, I, I talk to people who are about my age who are looking towards retirement. I go, you know, had we a, a universal health care system where you didn't have to worry about health care, you could go do something with the final years of your life that you want to do. We could actually take on jobs that we, would be our passion instead of we're stuck in this job for 30 years because we got to have the health care. And, and this is why I've always said employers don't want to get rid of it because they want to make sure that you're tied to that job to get that health care. Because it's always been curious to me why corporate America wants it other than as a controlling tool. Absolutely, because in point of fact, you know, they have plenty of, of uh, people who are good at math working for them, and they know that in the long run, and even in the short run, it would save them money, because whatever increases in taxes they would save in premiums, even at the pittance and the sort of ungenerous plans that they actually finance, it's exactly what you say. It's about a lack of freedom. It's about being tethered. And what's ironic about that is that that concept, freedom, which is something that the right wing has co-opted, utilized, and the left has been all too frequently scared to use, actually turns out to be one of the most effective animating values we can have on our side. And it's not at all shocking, right, that marriage equality, when it moved from the right to marry to the freedom to marry, and when it moved away from practical benefits, again, that's the adults in the room, like married filing jointly, hospital visitation, toward emotional arguments like love is love and love makes a family, that we began to gain ground. The same is true with the fight for 15. When we were told to talk about wages through practical terms like we need to raise wages because people will be customers in our stores and we have a consumer driven economy. People wouldn't repeat that because no one gets out of bed in the morning thinking I'm real passionate about the GDP and I can't wait how to grow it. But when we instead saw folks saying people who work for a living ought to earn a living. And obviously I'm biased because I work on these things, right? So I work on this messaging. Right not objective in evaluating it, but when we switch to a moral high ground argument that wasn't about customers in our stores and making sure that people can afford the basics, but instead asserting the money to pay people comes from their work. Why aren't they getting it? No, that's an excellent point. That is what, and I would argue the, the longer version about the economy and, and all that stuff, which look, you know, is, is, is a byproduct of higher wages, it, but it doesn't fit really nicely on a bumper sticker. And sadly, what's happened in our society is our thinking has continually shrunk down to now we need bumper stickers and sloganeering and 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 tweet levels. And now, fortunately, Twitter did increase their their number of characters. So our maybe we're expanding our thoughts a little bit. But it seems like, you know, we're 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 just social media thinkers and we're not we're not boiling it down to that emotional level in a, a more digestible level in my thoughts. Yeah. And. It is understandable that we want to blame social media and the character limits and so on. And that certainly has a huge role to play in terms of, for example, when we look at attention spans around digital ads and how long people will watch a thing without clicking off of it. It is completely obvious and you can sort of trace the trajectory of that shortening to the advent of social media, the increase of things like TikTok. But as far as the fact that we think through what people in my profession would call heuristics or simplifying structures, 
that's just a basic facet of human cognition that predates social media, predates the internet. Yeah. And in fact, what we see, and this shocks most people, is that the more higher education that you have, the more adept you are at discounting factual information that doesn't fit your pre-existing frame. Really? Yeah. What we like to say is that facts bounce off of frames. I often tell people that a more accurate way of thinking about our brains is I'll see it when I believe it, not the other way around. This is why people tell us, you know, I don't see racism, it's not happening. I don't see sexism, it's not occurring. Because the instances of those things that happen before your eyes, if you're not taught to categorize it as such, you simply are like, well, that's not an instance of that. That's not an instance of working people being screwed. That's not an instance of corporate malfeasance. Or, you know, that happened once, but that's not a pattern. That's not how things work. Okay. And the reason why people with a greater amount of formal education are really good at discounting facts that don't fit their pre-existing frames is because they have more cemented cognitive biases. Interesting. Uh, I, I see. I would have thought it would be kind of the other way around. The more the, the more that you 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 knew, maybe the more you would kind of weigh the differences. So you're saying that you know the the deeper I'm invested in my education, uh, the more I'm going to be dug in, uh, as opposed to you know if I you know barely got out of high school biology and now I'm a virologist and I'm not getting the vaccine. So there's two different phenomena. There is the phenomena of folks whose cognition is very, very closely attached, not to rational thought, but to behavioral, to emotional cues and identity. And that tends to correspond with lower levels of formal education. And that is sort of all of the stuff that we know about that you're describing of tribalism. And a lot of that identity, you know, some people's identity actually as an element of it is refusing to listen to people and outside of that identity group and sort of prejudging people outside of your identity group as being wrong you know before they even speak i'm just talking about the very specific thing of being able to accidentally wander through an airport you see fox news they're blathering some bullshit and you're like, oh, I know that that's not true, right? And you have sort of a very sophisticated analysis around why that fact that's presented to you is in fact completely biased. Well, it's just because it's on Fox News, that's all you need to know, or at least that's my thought. Uh, but no, I, I, it sounds like you're right. So are we screwed? I mean, is this where, you know, you know both, everyone, the, the, the most intelligent and the most dim are dug in? Is there any movement? Yeah, I mean, my theory of change is that you have, I mean, this isn't just a theory, this is sort of corroborated through a lot of people's study and evidence. You have a group of people who are ideologically cemented on the left, right? I'm gonna say that's me, I'm gonna guess that's you. Someone could talk at you all day long, I'm gonna guess, and you're never going to believe in abolishing the minimum wage. There is no argument a person's going to make. You're never going to believe in a flat tax, right? No one could say anything to you that's going to get you there. Same with me across lots of issues. Just like there are folks like us on the left who are ideologically not moving, there are people like that on the right. But in terms of issues, now I'm not talking about partisan, I'm not talking about party yet, I'm talking about how we feel about issues, most people actually fall somewhere in the middle. They are what I like to call the good point people. They go like this, good point, but also good point. They are swayed by arguments from either side and what they hear repeated most frequently becomes the way the world works, common sense, what is true. This is the only way to explain the rapidity with which our culture has shifted in our views about, to take an example I used earlier, marriage equality, right? It wasn't that long ago that it seemed completely and totally inconceivable that we would legalize gay marriage right. in this country, and here we are. So what gets repeated most often, I mean, this is both frightening and it is also empowering. 
messages that are familiar to people are reported to be more likable, more credible, more moving. So what people hear repeated over and over again actually becomes more true for them because it creates what we like to call cognitive ease. It's like when you hear da 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 and your brain goes da da. When your brain does that for you and you don't have to work, you like that message better. It feels comfortable because it feels familiar. So basically the name of the game is finding messages that the choir is gonna wanna sing, that is gonna get folks to repeat, repeat, repeat a thing so that the middle hears it. Because the way that we persuade people is actually by having their peer network do it, not by having sort of professional organizations do it interesting so real quick then you know what's the message on this infrastructure bill because everybody i know wants this infrastructure bill especially the bipartisan part of it uh but we also want the, the human infrastructure part of it what's that what's that messaging uh that, that will get us to that place to make us all warm and fuzzy with it yeah so if you specifically mean infrastructure as opposed to the build better um uh the build back better uh, part. App, Thank you. Build back better. Thank you. Um, so much for me being on top of my messaging, right? Um, so if we're talking about infrastructure, what we see in survey after survey after survey, people don't have feelings about infrastructure, right? Like you never hugged infrastructure. That's not a word that most people use in their common everyday vocabulary. So first and foremost, we want to make it imageable, make it tangible for people. So the road that you drive on, the bridge that you cross, the bus that your grandmother takes, being able to cross town and get to where you need to go on time. So first of all, using that kind of language. And then again, selling the payoff, not the recipe. So this bill is about where we need to go and how we're gonna get there. It's about the roads we drive on and the jobs that we're able to have. It's about bringing clean renewable it's about bringing clean energy into our communities protecting the air that we breathe and the water that we put in our kids cups so it's really about bringing it back to sort of how would these things feel as part of my everyday life yeah how do you make my life better and this is this is where i started off the beginning of the year it's about getting things done it's about making people's lives better it's about moving the country forward and it's about getting the internet uh, that is actually not costing an arm and a leg uh, that is still somewhat decent in a rural community that to me that's the big one but annette i appreciate you taking some time for us, sharing your expertise i hope you'll come back and talk to us again real soon Thanks for having me. Uh, good stuff. Anat uh, Shanker Azario. She's the principal and founder of ASO Communications. Make sure you check out their website, asocommunications.com. Going to take a quick break right here. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith.